At the age of 16, he had a master plan for becoming one of the best-known journalists in all of Britain. He's been in the midst of media scandals, he's interviewed some of the most famous celebrities and most powerful politicians in the world, and he's judged the talents of hundreds of common folks. Arrogant, ambitious, and shameless, well, who is this media man? Well, of course, it's none other than Piers Morgan. Morgan was born in Sussex, that's in England, in 1965, to an Irish dentist who unfortunately died when Morgan was only two years old. At birth, Morgan was named Piers Stephen O'Meara, but Morgan's mother remarried after his father's death, and Morgan, he adopted the surname Pew Morgan. Morgan and his stepfather, they were pretty close, and Morgan, having never really known his birth farmer, calls him dad. His parents, they were middle-class English, they ran a pub, and they supported Maggie Thatcher. When Morgan was 13 years old, the family could no longer afford to send him to private school, so he had to leave behind the classmates that he knew. At his new school, well, he was picked on, and in true schoolboy fashion, the name Pew, well, that was changed to Puke. They are hilarious, aren't they? Morgan, as you probably know, he dropped Pew from his name later on, a move that some have attributed to a desire to separate from his middle class roots, but that Morgan himself just said was because Pew Morgan was too long for a byline. As a child, Morgan, he showed an early affinity for the media. As early as age seven, he would sit at the table, devouring the daily newspapers, reading the headlines, and discussing the day's events with his parents. Now, by the time he was a teenager, he was already writing news articles, he even actually sold a piece to the Mid-Sussex Times and then to Cricket Magazine at the age of only 14. He said of this, it gave me the real taste of the excitement of a byline. It's probably no surprise to you then that a couple of years later, when it was time for a career to happen, Morgan had set his mind on the fact that he would become the most famous media personality in all of Britain. He developed this master plan and opted not to take an offer from Warwick University to study history. The reason for this was simply because this would have kept his master plan on hold for a few years while he completed his education. So instead, he went directly to Harlow College and dived into the formal study of journalism as soon as he could. Morgan's first formal journalism gig was at the South London News, and then he joined The Sun to write the gossip column, which was entitled Bizarre. As The Guardian put it, Morgan spent his years at The Sun grinning inanely while posing next to a succession of personalities. Morgan, well, he wouldn't disagree with The Guardian's characterization of his initial years in the media, as he himself told the BBC he made a point of putting himself in the middle of stories, posing for pictures with celebrities, and generally getting his name and face out there for all of Britain to see. Well, this tactic, it totally worked. By 1994, at the age of only 29, Morgan secured his place in British media history when Rupert Murdoch named him as editor of the News of the World. Piers Morgan, he was the youngest editor ever of the News of the World and the youngest editor of a paper in Britain in five decades. The News of the World had the largest circulation of any paper in the country at the time, and the editorship gave Morgan a platform in which to put his hard-charging, oft-controversial journalistic methods on display for a huge population of readers. He even helped breach the previously untouchable barricade of the royal family. By the summer of 1994, Princess Diana and Prince Charles's marriage it was on its way to its official end, and Morgan and the News of the World, they weren't going to miss out on the opportunity to publish on potentially juicy royal scandals. Morgan Morgan had caught wind that James Hewitt, an officer in the British military, wanted to spill the beans about his affair with Princess Diana. With no fear of potential repercussion or for the long-held level of dignity with which the royals had been treated, Morgan reached out to Hewitt and arranged to interview him for a story. He and his associate, they actually even bugged the room where they did the interview so they would have absolute proof of everything that was said. Then later that year in the fall, a book about Prince Charles and his private life it was set to be published. While the news of the world, they didn't have any excerpts, the Sunday Times Times totally did. Morgan, well, he wasn't ready to give a scoop to another paper, and nor was he willing to take no as an answer when he was denied access to information from the Sunday Times. Instead, he directed Rebecca Brooks, who had helped him out on the hotel interview, to disguise herself, sneak into the Sunday Times offices, grab a copy, and get it back to the News of the World as quickly as possible. Well, this little bit of espionage, it totally worked. In the News of the World, they were able to publish the story about Diana and Charles long before any other paper except for the Sunday Times. So, if 
If Piers Morgan wanted to be a, a really famous journalist, I mean, why did he settle for running gossipy relationship stories? Well, the answer was because to him, everything was news. There is a type of snobbish, pompous journalist who thinks that the only news that has any validity is war, famine, pestilence, or politics. I don't come from that school. This egalitarian attitude has allowed Morgan to quickly prove his mettle and his willingness to do whatever it took to be successful in breaking stories. But he only lasted at the News of the World for a bit over a year. Though Morgan said he left the publication of his own accord, the timing of his exit coincided with the publication of a photo of Princess Diana's sister-in-law leaving an addiction treatment clinic, the publication of which even Rupert Murdoch said went too far. Now, in 1995, shortly after this photo ran, Morgan, he moved on to head up The Mirror, another paper owned by Rupert Murdoch. Here, his tenure, it lasted much longer than it did at the News of the World. The number of controversial stories, though, it was much larger, and as a result, his profile it continued to rise, even outside of Britain. But true to form, it only took a year before Morgan found himself embroiled in his first major controversy at The Mirror. The day before England was set to play Germany in the Euro 96 Football Championships, The Mirror ran a headline and a photo on its front page that many did not find very amusing. Above a doctored image of two players wearing World War II helmets was the headline Achtung Surrender. For you, Fritz, the Euro 96 championship is over. Next to it was a letter written by Morgan himself in the style of Neville Chamberlain. Reportedly, Morgan also planned a publicity stunt that involved driving a tank to the German embassy. In the ensuing uproar about the headline, well, that later stunt, it was subsequently cancelled. Suddenly, though, Morgan, he found himself in this position that his hard-charging personality it didn't seem suited for. He had to apologize. There were fears the kind of attitude promoted by the headline may incite acts of violence during the games. Though Morgan, he was apologizing, he was still right where he wanted to be, and of course, that would be the center of attention. In 2000, though, the attention turned from an editorial decision he had made to a more personal financial scandal. A competing newspaper published a story alleging that Morgan had bought £20,000 worth of stock in a computer company and that he had made the purchase just before the Mirror ran a piece naming the stock as a good buy. An inquiry began, and it was decided that while Morgan had breached an ethical code of conduct, he could keep his job. Other Mirror employees, well, they weren't so lucky. The columnists who wrote on stock buys, they lost their jobs, and it was another four years before Morgan was cleared of any wrongdoing. However, it actually came out later that it bought additional stock under his wife's name, another £70,000 worth. By the time that that later revelation came about, Morgan was already on the skids at the Mirror. As editor, he had been leading the charge against the Iraq War in the British press, loudly criticizing then Prime Minister Tony Blair for his support of the war. Among the stories published on the war under Morgan's leadership was a piece that included a photo of British soldiers abusing Iraqi prisoners. As recently as a 2016 BBC interview, Morgan he defended the photos, saying they were real and that the British government had a vested interest in getting rid of me, their biggest thorn in the side about the war. However, the Mirror, it didn't defend them strongly in the wake of the allegations that they were actually fake. The British people instead, they actually got a paper with a large headline that stated, sorry, we were hoaxed. And then the man who had okayed the publication of the photos, well, he was subsequently out of a job. When Morgan's firing was announced, staff members at the paper, they were in tears. After nearly a decade, Piers Morgan's reign at the Daily Mirror, it was over. True to form, though, he absolutely did not slink away into the night. Instead, he became a regular feature on people's TV screens. Though he had already been appearing on TV before leaving the newspaper business, Morgan stepped up his involvement with the broadcast media after its firing. One of the first offers Morgan received for a regular TV gig was via a text message from Simon Cowell. And then in 2006, America welcomed Morgan into their homes as he served as a judge on America's Got Talent. He also judged Britain's Got Talent and even appeared on the then just a mogul Donald Trump's reality show, The Celebrity Apprentice. Morgan actually won his season of The Celebrity Apprentice and in the process became close friends with now President Donald Trump. Morgan said all along that he believed Trump would be president and has been outspoken about his dislike for the protests that erupted after Trump's election. Interestingly, Morgan's diatribes on the subject have even led some celebrities to decline interviews with him. But Morgan, he knew what opening his mouth could lead to. He's no stranger to the ins and outs of the American political and media institutions. He served as the 
host of a primetime show on CNN for several years, after all. So when Larry King announced his retirement in 2010, Morgan was named as the replacement for the longtime iconic American host. The show, it started strong, with Morgan able to book some of the biggest names in media and politics for interviews. Oprah, Rudy Giuliani, Ricky Gervais, Condoleezza Rice, and even two of the Kardashian sisters. And, well, he made just as many headlines for the interviews he didn't do as well. Madonna was deemed too old to appear on his show and banned from ever being a guest. But unfortunately for Morgan, the initial hype it wore off quickly. Morgan had a different style from King, and he was a British person taking over an American news and interview show. Ultimately, he lasted only three years in the host's chair as poor ratings doomed him to failure. He's attributed the show's failure to a clash of cultures, citing such factors as his own outspoken opposition to guns as one such example of cultural differences that just couldn't be bridged. The CNN show, though, it wasn't Morgan's only project during that time period. He was also hosting Life Stories for ITV, whose subjects were as diverse as Sharon Osbourne and the Prime Minister. And now today he's the permanent co-host for Good Morning Britain, where he keeps himself in the spotlight, mostly recently sparring with a gender-fluid guest over the validity of gender fluidity. In this interview, in his pretty classic, blunt style, Morgan asked the 21-year-old guest, if you can identify as whoever the hell you like, can I literally look at myself and say, I'm an elephant today? Amidst his rise to television stardom, Morgan had to contend with accusations dating back to his newspaper days. In 2005, the News of the World, which, remember, Morgan headed up for a year, published a story about Prince Harry injuring himself. The only way that they could have gotten the details for that story, claimed royal officials, was if they had hacked personal voicemails. This set off a series of events that rocked the British media, political, and celebrity world. Arrests were made, investigations were done, lawsuits were filed, and it took six years before some actual action was taken to address the phone hacking scandal. Rupert Murdoch he issued apologies for the phone hacking in print in the form of a full-page ad in the last issue of the News of the World. Rebecca Brooks, the same Rebecca who Morgan had used to break into the Sunday Times office, resigned as CEO of News International. After her resignation, though, more bad news was headed away because she was arrested, but then she was released on bail. The FBI then opens their own investigation into the news of the world and the allegations that they were hacking the phones of 9-11 victims. Indeed, this scandal was so wide-ranging that even London's police department was investigated for corruption. Needless to say, well, the scandal, it totally enveloped England and the world. It was paying attention. Though Morgan had been out of the newspaper world for some time, he was not immune to being questioned about the scandal. In fact, he had to answer questions regarding to the voicemails of one of England's most famous personas, Sir Paul McCartney. McCartney's ex-wife, Heather Mills, had alleged that her voicemails had been listened to after she and McCartney had had a fight in 2001. A reporter who called her just seemed to know too much, and Mills maintained that she hadn't shared the voicemails with anyone else and that she had actually deleted them all. The only way the reporter could have known so much was if he had hacked or listened to the voicemails or had talked to someone who had. Morgan admitted that he had heard a message from McCartney to Mills and as a result he was called to testify in the 2011 inquiry into phone hacking. Morgan wouldn't reveal how he'd come to hear the message and he also maintained that he never authorized the hacking of voicemails at the News of the World or the Daily Mirror. The head of the phone hacking inquiry, Lord Leveson, called Morgan's testimony that he didn't know about the phone hacking to be utterly unpersuasive. And well, despite his denials of direct involvement, in the hacking, Morgan, he was interviewed by the police about the hacking in both 2013 and 2015. Phone hacking, incendiary headlines, taping interviews about the royals, you might think that would be enough for any one person to face in the course of a media career. But Piers Morgan, he has been embroiled in personal controversy with other celebrities as well. One much publicized drama stemmed from an action Morgan took as the editor of the Daily Mirror. He published photos of Top Gear host Jeremy Clarkson with a woman who was not his wife. Clarkson, understandably, was perturbed by these photos being put out there for all of the world to see. So what did Clarkson do? Well, he decided to hurl a glass of water in Morgan's face. That might not seem out of place in your average bar, but on board the last flight of the Concorde, the alteration, well, it stood out. And the fact that it was between two highly visible members of the British media, well, even better. A feud between these two men, well, it officially started. And this feud, it wasn't a minor thing. It literally came to blows in 2004 when Clarkson punched Morgan in the head at the National Press Awards. Clarkson broke a finger, Morgan gained a scar, and the celebrity got 
gossip writers, well, they gained a new story. Though the feud lingered for a few years, the two men were able to bond over drinks in 2015, and, well, the feud ended. At the time, Clarkson was going through a divorce and confided about his troubles to Morgan, who was able to empathize. I sense that Jeremy's just pretty much like every other 50-something in life, angst-ridden from damaged relationships, grieving loved ones, irritated by work-related issues, and battling inner demons. By the time he entered his 50s, Morgan was acquainted with many of the same trials and tribulations that Clarkson had dealt with. His own marriage fell apart by the mid-2000s, and he and his first wife, Marion Shallow, officially divorced in 2008 after 27 years of marriage. The marriage it produced three sons, and Morgan makes a point of staying in close contact with his children. In fact, amidst all of the demands on his time, Morgan has made a point of speaking to his children every single day. After his divorce, Morgan he began dating Celia Walden, a fellow journalist. The couple they married in 2010, and a year later they had a daughter. Though both are British, they now primarily reside in New York. Walden often shares details of their married life in her columns, and Morgan even joins in some of the time. The two even teamed up to write a column about a trip to Paris, in which Morgan steps back from his desire to be known by everyone. Paris has always been one of my favorite cities because the French neither know who I am nor care. This means I can behave in a wildly reckless manner and maintain a reasonable confidence that the shameful images will never appear on the cover of the National Enquirer. Though he claims he doesn't want his own personal shame shared in the National Enquirer, Morgan has made a career out of sharing the intimate details of other people's lives. He's never been shy about sharing his political opinions or any opinions. He's made a name for himself, he's made a few enemies along the way, and shows absolutely no sign of stepping out of the spotlight anytime soon. From middle-class Sussex to the TV sets of people around the world, Piers Morgan has lived out the plan he wrote at the age of 17. And he's still got plenty of career left to go. What will the world see next from Piers Morgan? Well, whatever it is, when it happens, well, we'll surely see it in the news. So that was Piers Morgan, his life. Well, so far. If you did like this video, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe for brand new videos every Monday and Thursday. Check out some of our other videos from the past over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.